I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's fitting that we met here randomly at the Emerson Bar in Clinton Hill today because, <laughs> you know, I, I was at a meeting at City Hall earlier where Melissa Mark Viverito, the speaker, assembled uh, all the ethnic or many of the ethnic and community media to talk yes. about better outreach. I think she's appointed someone um, to, to handle that outreach, which I think is a, a certain kind of coming of age of, of our entire industry. And also the news that Gary Pierre Pierre is stepping down from his role at CCEM. Yeah, I just heard um, about that today. Yeah, I mean, you work very closely with Gary. What do you think the role of, of that center has has been in in sort of creating a kind of community there which, where there wasn't really before? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, <clears throat> this to get a perspective of what CCEM has done, we kind of have to go back uh, and, you know, to talk a little bit about what was there before. What existed before CCEM was something called the Independent Press Association mm -hmm. um, that was started by Abby Shearer. It was taken over by Juan Aponce de Leon. And what they were trying to do, what they tried to do rather, was they tried to lend that legitimacy to, um, you know, ethnic and immigrant media. And they would have different they would have different sessions where folks would come in, you know, learn how to, to cover, you know, politics or learn how to cover economics to get just some of the basic information that you would need. And then eventually what happened was that one of their biggest accomplishments actually was that they gathered a group of, um, in uh, the first the first uh, election that uh, President Obama won in, when, when was that? that um, oh, wait. Oh, wait, correct, all right, oh, wait. So they gathered a, a, a several of the ethnic media um, from Novogenic, from, um, Aramica at the time, now defunct, I believe, um, and just a bunch of ethnic uh, reporters, and sent them to uh, Minis uh, to St. Paul and to Colorado to cover the presidential election. And that was the first time that it happened. The New York Times wrote a piece about it, and they looked at the piece. Kind of looked at how you know this was the first time you know ethnic press had been able to go out, and IPA started that. And CCEM has continued that process hmm. of educating reporters. You know, some of the reporters who work in ethnic press come with the background already. Some of them are already journalists. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of them, what they need here is just an understanding of how the American system works. Mm -hmm. Right. You right. know. I was going to ask about that. Right. Yeah. And yeah. what the CCEM has, is, is trying to do, continuously trying to do, is show them through bringing in, for instance, like a spokesperson or somebody from an, uh, a governmental organization that deals with a particular issue, to come in to press conferences or to hold seminars where folks can be taught just some basic information. So they kind of kind of discern, hey, listen, I need to ask this question. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're dealing with a story about housing, you know, I need to ask this question against that question, you know? Well, not only that, but you gotta also take into account that those people might not get a press credentials from the NYPD and they well, don't have the access. Thing, that's, one, that's the thing uh, IPA yeah. and Enigma were right. working on a lot is yes. the press cards. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So right. bringing elected officials is also an opportunity to have access to them and if you have questions or right. stories that you're pursuing that have to do with that elected officials, right. then this is your chance right. um, mm -hmm. to have that yeah. access. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And CCM has, has done, you know, They've done a lot towards doing that. To just and they've, uh, the, the Voices in New York, right. which, which obviously is a better, uh, more aggressive version of what occurred before. But exactly. this yes. is, uh, this is um, for people who don't know, it's a, uh, a several times a week rundown yes. of stories in the in yeah. not foreign language press, mm -hmm. some of which are a take in those papers and a story we're all following, like Eric Garner, mm -hmm. and some of which you would not hear about otherwise. Not at all. Yeah. And it's, it's terrific. And mm -hmm. it's admirable because I've, you know, we've looked into at City Limits the expense of translating stuff mm -hmm. into, in, just into Spanish, let alone other languages. Yes. And it's, it's not It's cheap. not only yeah, translating, not. they also have original content because I have contributed right, some right. articles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm curious, how is the Arne Eric Garner case playing in the, in the ethnic media? How, how's it looking for you? You know, I mean, for me, in my personal experience, it's kind of a little surprising. It could be not surprising, but surprising at the same time, because Latinos often detach themselves from the African-American community or the black community. You know, right. they always self-identify, oh no, I'm Latino, I'm an immigrant, I'm from somewhere else. But now it's like, wait, you know, that can happen to me. You know, we share the same neighborhoods. We have similar skin colors. You know, we are poor. We live in the projects too. You know, so it's, it's I think a lot of people feel identified uh, yeah. with, uh, you know, what happened to him. And, and, and they do, you know, say that 
Um, you know, a lot of the comments I've read on like the Facebook pages of, of right. where we post articles, they say, oh yes, you know, police every time they stop you, it's for no reason. Uh, so I can see this happening anywhere. So yeah, they, they really feel, um, and if you see the protests, I mean, a lot of them are out there too. Parents who never been in protest anywhere, they really felt like they needed to be there because they're part of the group that's really affected by policing in this in this city. That's interesting. So have you dealt with this yet on independent sources or have we, you thought about how to approach it? We've, um, the way we've approached it on the show, look at the general kind of police reform, this idea of police reform, you know? Um, because one of the things, as Marlena was saying, is that from, um, you know, reading pieces, for instance, in the Haitian Times, um, Gary Pierre, who works for the show and also um, publishes the Haitian Times, his son Cameron, <coughs> excuse me, who's biracial, I need to add this because this is important to the story, <laughs> is um, he wrote a piece in the, in, for the paper talking about the fact that he's biracial and what he saw with all the protests wasn't about color, that the argument, it's not about color anymore and it's not, mm. not necessarily about ethnic enclaves, it's about what's right and what's wrong hmm. and it's about, hey listen, everybody's involved. And for, and, and the piece was kind of talking about, hey, listen, you know, for anything to change, for there to be any kind of sense of movement, social movement, it has to be across, across color, across races, across, you know, ethnic right. enclaves, if anything needs to kind of be done. What's interesting about that is like, so white people have a tendency to see anybody who's not white as part of this sort of one yeah. mass. So yeah. it's interesting that prior to this, Latinos did not necessarily feel common cause with African Americans on these issues. So, like, what about the? Because there have been other police killings, they've been horrible. They've gotten people in the streets. What about this has made it special and, and had that sort of fusion I mean, effect? I had to correct myself. It's, it was not only. I wasn't referring to just policing, but you know, in general. A general you know, sort it's of like it's, it's cause, a separate right. community, and yeah. you know, they're them and we're us. You right, know, right, it's, right. it's it was more like that. But then. When pol and, and I guess in the policing situation is how often these cases have been documented, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. having the, the ability to watch the video of people being, you know, beat up by police. It's like, right. I've seen this before. It was not caught on camera, but I see, I've seen that in my neighborhood. And I wanted to kind of go about the point that you made that is not only, no longer about raised that it's more about was right and wrong. We also need to understand the culture. And in, in the culture of community of, of colors, there's always been an issue with trust with the police. Right. Way before Eric Garner, way before any of these issues. So I think, again, by having so many cases one after the other, it kind of made things worse. And People are saying, well, this happened in the past and they have reformed, but it keeps happening and it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. So why should we trust now, you know, when we keep on seeing this situation? Mm -hmm. So I think trust is, is, is a big issue. Yes, it's got to be everybody participating because, you know, people of color are depending on other communities to make those decisions. You know, who is at the top? Right. It's white people, if we're going to talk about, you know, uh, race or color. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why this mayor is struggling, too, to kind of answer, you know, uh, those concerns about, oh, now who do I put at the top? Because right, right, that's right. part of what people are asking for. Right. And, yeah, then the argument goes, oh, now we have a diversity quota there. Right. You know, it's not a quota. It is people who've been in the streets, who grew up in the projects, who knows what's like. Right. to be stopped by a police. Yeah, yeah. And nobody's denying there is crime. Nobody. Nobody right. has made that argument. But, right. you know, the, the information's kind of getting lost, and I think the smaller papers or, uh, you know, the media kind of can, is able to portray that, portray that you got to understand the culture in order to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. right. I, I, I agree with you, Marlena. I think, I think what happens is this, and, you know, <laughs> If, 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 if t to be completely honest, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, papers like, for instance, I'm sorry, calling out names, but the bigger <laughs> papers like, you know, the New York Times, the Daily News and so forth, you know, these papers don't necessarily have the perspective 
that somebody who is from a community who has connections, like an emotional connection to that community. Sometimes they don't even <laughs> send people to those neighborhoods. So exactly. Let's not get there. Exactly. Yes, we know. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. And I think what I think what happens with the ethnic media, as, you know, as Marlene was saying, is that you know they're able to to go into these stories and kind of come out of it very differently. So immigration, that's a topic that is covered in the English language mainstream press and also. So if you were reading El Diario or, or talking to some of the publications you talked to, what do they add to that coverage that we're not, that I'm not getting from what I read? So like resources, yeah. resources. Just, the just, prior Times, just the priority. Right? The New York Times can tell you policy, right? Oh, Boehner said this or Obama didn't do this, or who was behind uh, Pelosi's ear. Right. Like, our people don't care about that stuff, you know? It's like, who, who is that person, you know? Why is it not? You know, the issue is, once Obama signs this, or once Pelosi, you know, for whatever reason right. says, I'm voting no, what does that mean for the immigrant here? Mm -hmm. How is that gonna affect me? And that's, you know, we personalize it as, okay, the worker, the, the jornalero, the, the day laborer who's out there waiting maybe to get uh, documentation. What does that mean? Oh, then I'm going to have to wait until next year for them to go again and vote. You know, that's how we try to kind of translate political language right. to our community. And that's, that's the difference between, you know, mainstream yeah. and us. Yeah, and, and to, to piggyback on what Marlena said, you know, it's, it's about... <laughs> You know, it's this, this idea of resources and getting the voices of perhaps people, you know, in power and so forth to make comments. But the essence of a lot of stories that, that come out of, you know, community ethnic media, uh, really about the people, you know, mm -hmm. and in the everyday. For instance, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there is a, an organization in, it's a health center in the Bronx. It's called Borinquen, Borinquen, excuse me. And when everybody was talking about how bad um, the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. was, right. uh, or Obamacare, how horrible it was. <laughs> what had happened was that there's a, part of the, there's a part of the legislation that basically gave money to health centers, yep. right? right? And this organization, Borican, was able to get funding, build an entire new structure, get a bunch of you know, um, amenities and all that kind of stuff, and started helping the community. So they were, you know, they were taking care of people who did not have health care at the time, telling them, come in, you know, get checked up. If you have the flu, come in. You can, get your, you can get AIDS tested and all that sort of stuff. So when the mainstream media, a lot of it was about, oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. this is the president's legacy and that sort of stuff. And having these very high-minded conversations, which are fine, mm -hmm. what the ethnic press was kind of talking about was, hey, listen, hey, you know, this organization here, they're doing a really great thing for the community. And everybody else is having this other conversation and a lot of people are like, you know what, that's okay, but I really just want to make sure that I can, that I'm not sick and I don't miss a day of work, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, right. That's yeah. what, and that's the kind of stuff you get right. from the other person. Yeah. 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 I think, yeah. you know, in journalism, you're supposed to be the government watchdog, but we also need to be the voice of, you know, give a voice to the voiceless. Right, it's a two-way street, yeah. So, yeah. you know, so I think the mainstream kind of takes the government side right. and the ethnic media go for what the community right. needs or, you know. And when right. you say side, you don't necessarily mean you're, they're, you're, they're reporting for them. They're just telling you no, that. Yes, no, yeah, yeah. Well, right, right, right. Well, yes. I mean, immigration is a great uh, example, actually, of what from my perch as a fourth generation American is easy to perceive as a, like, potential, I don't know, duality in the role of ethnic press, right? Mm -hmm. Because, so my familiarity with it is basically going into an Irish bar and reading Home and Away, which mm -hmm. is this newspaper that's in Irish bars, and it tells people what's going on at home. Right. It doesn't tell you very much at all about what's happening here. And so clearly the purpose there is to like maintain a connection mm -hmm. for people yes. who are going to be going back and forth. And like this is an age-old question with immigration in New York. What is, is the purpose to maintain ethnic enclaves so you people can sort of remain intact, or is it to assimilate people? Mm -hmm. So. I mean, do you feel like different ethnic media play that differently? Is everyone trying to do both those roles? Do they take it like? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think what, and I think that role has evolved, and I'll tell you why. When one of the first interviews we did on the show was we, we did a profile of the Amsterdam News and the Jewish, um, the Jewish Forward, which are two at the time, well, still are two of the oldest papers, ethnic papers in the right, city. Sure. Okay, over a hundred years. 
And at the time, J.J. Goldberg, who was the editor at the time, said to me, you know what, when the Jewish Ford started, it was all about ethnic defending. It was basically because people didn't know what was going on in the community. Part of it was, most of it was written in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And it was a way for, you know, Jewish folks to air out their dirty laundry amongst one another. So it was, it was our world and you kind of stayed on the outside. Right, it was kind of a safe space. Exactly, it was a safe space. What's happened is that now the forward is in English and it's basically, yeah, it's airing that laundry out for everybody to see. Mm -hmm. So it's one in one way, it's, it's still, yes, a little bit of ethnic defending, if you will, because there will be, you know, p- parts where, you know, folks will speak out against anti-Semitism and so forth. <clears throat> but for the most part, it's about reporting on stories in the community to tell, hey, listen, to tell folks in the community, this is what's happening. Help folks who may be new to, yes, assimilate a little better. Maybe where's a good school. They'll do a, right. a piece about education or they'll do a piece about, hey, listen, there's a young Jewish uh, a writer or, a, uh, or an all an all-Orthodox Jewish, uh, all-woman Orthodox Jewish uh, rock group. Right. Right? Stuff right. like that. Cultural that's stuff, right. that's mm-hmm. cultural stuff that will, you know, that'll get folks to know what's going on. But also to what they're, you know, what they're trying to do is to maintain the balance. It's like, because to be legitimate, to be seen, and, you know, publications, ethnic pub- publications struggle to, to, to gain that sense of legitimacy in the eyes of people who are not from their community, mm-hmm. you know? And so to be legitimate, to be able to say, hey, listen, you know what, we're journalists, we're good journalists, we're, we're good at what we do. We have to write leads, we have to do research, you know, right. we have to have a good nut graph. All of that stuff matters in the pieces that we do. They're just in different languages. So just because you don't understand what we're saying, because, you know, it's, the scribe is different, doesn't mean what's there doesn't have content. Huh. So I think, you know, um, I think that's what a lot of ethnic media is trying to do now. They're, they're safely trying to, to, to toe that line. In an era when the media is generally challenged to engage its readership and when everyone's running away from print, the ethnic and community media have largely stuck with that. And they might be, you know, when when all of us have sort of forgotten totally how to actually be important to our readers, the ethnic press probably will will remain that way, right? Because they they do play that like singular kind of role as a portal. Brought me to another point. I don't want to name names. But, you know, they say, oh, the print media is going to die, and they don't really do original <laughs> stuff. But then when you watch TV, right. where are they getting those the stories story. from? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our stories are, you know, on TV all the time. Mm-hmm. And you can just compare, you know, the, 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 the dates of publication with right. how yeah. they're showing it on TV. And you can, oh. They must have read El Diario, and that's why yeah. <laughs> they right, have that right. story. You know what I mean? So we kind of contribute a lot to what gets out there sure. in the mainstream. So. Well, you make it too easy because, you know, we offer you free beer and <laughs> come here and you're on. There you go. There you go. I want to piggyback on what Marlena said. And, um, you know, one of the things that happened, and I found it really fascinating, was when everybody, when the, you know, the financial crisis hit, mm-hmm. And it was just around the time, you know, everybody was starting to talk about, you know, print is dead. Everything has to go online. And, you know, the New York Times was bleeding money. And everybody was like, oh, my God, this is the end of print. And the conversation continues to to this day still. What was fascinating to me at the time was that when the major papers were feeling it already, the ethnic papers were doing just fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were still printing. And we we did a piece about the fact that they were like, we have a niche market. They still want to read our papers. Our circulation, mm-hmm. some people's circulation didn't fall, Not didn't take that, much of a hit. new papers were actually being yeah, created. Being created, Absolutely. right? And For new so, groups. Mm-hmm. Exactly, yeah, right. exactly. And the thing that I think, again, that happens, there's a separation that happens between groups of people. People long established here who are, you know, the majority here. When people from other countries come here, they are familiar with a few things. People will tell you, they listen to radio, they read their newspaper. Mm-hmm. So many people, I mean, still don't go on the internet for their news. Mm-hmm. And yes, yes, the internet provides news for millions of people. Yes. But the fact of the matter is, for a lot of new immigrants, they still like to pick up the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And they still like to listen to radio. I'll give you an example. Um, we're doing a piece right now on a Quechua radio station. Quechua. 
it's an indigenous language to South and Central America. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a dying language too. But there's a Quechua radio station. Do you know why there's a Quechua radio station? Because there are people in New York who speak this dying language who are being deported because they can't, they can't fend for themselves in court. So a language, a, a station was created to teach these people about, you know, different things about the, the system, how it works, maybe right, to speak basics. a couple of Spanish, uh, English words and all that sort of stuff. And so if you're telling me that, you know, and maybe there might even be a, a, a Quechua newspaper, we don't know. We right. don't know if that'll come out of that, right. you know. So it's, it's stuff like that, that makes, that, you know, that kind of flies in the face of all the folks who say, you know, print is dead and there's no space for it because this is an enclave industry. And believe me, no matter how advanced we get, no matter how advanced I get, sure, I have a phone that has the newspaper and everything like that, but come on. I like to pick up my, my newspaper and feel it in my hand. That might just make me be old and, and, and curmudgeonly or whatever. But well, you in, know. In, no, in our case, there is, there is something different happening too with the online because our community is mostly poor <coughs> and a lot of recent immigrants they don't have a computer at home. They are buying the paper, but if you have access to a phone, right. you can read El Diario on your phone. And that's where the company is noticing that we're getting a, a huge influx of readers. It's not the internet, but it's the mobile phone. Right. Why? Because if they didn't pick up the El Diario early enough, at seven, eight o'clock when they were on their way to work, you know, they can have access to it by phone. So that's one of the things they're trying to, out of so many things they got to deal with because our community is so diverse on its own. It's also the fact that many have access to a cell phone right. and they're able to, to read the paper on their cell phone. There's some information to suggest that immigration is slowing down because economic changes because of security on the border mm -hmm. other things like that and you know one set of my grandparents were Polish and they always argued with each other in Polish but they refused to teach my mother Polish mm -hmm. and I don't know any Polish other than the birthday song right. um, because they were intent on on being Americans right. and it, I think we see this in, in some groups now including among you know some second or third generation Spanish-speaking immigrants mm -hmm. that that the children actually beyond being capable in English actually don't speak Spanish mm -hmm. at all or very well so do we think there will always be the kind of ethnic press we have now or will we see that start to fall away will it evolve to be to be more of a sort of a cultural kind of repository yeah. It's always going to be immigration, Absolutely. you know, that's not going to, it might get smaller depending on what the situation is, but this is a city that's known and it's been like this since its initial, you know, uh, you know, it's when it was found. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, and, and, and again, if you think of Puerto Ricans, for example, who are American citizens and the ones who live in New York are like third or maybe fourth generation Puerto Ricans. You get, you're having recent um, islanders moving mm -hmm. into New York or Florida. So you have to keep on catering to the culture back home because you still got this group that's coming, right? right? Even though the rest of them have assimilated to the New York culture or to the mainstream culture. So I don't think this is going to die anytime soon. Uh, it's always going to be immigration. This is the capital of the world, right. and people always want to come here. Yeah. So yeah, I, I definitely think maybe immigrants will change mm -hmm. or countries right. of Where origin, right, right. Right. but there's still going right. to be immigration. Exactly, and I think to your point, uh, Jared, I think that there will be perhaps a further evolution, and I think, I mean, it could be for several reasons. It could be one because. Um, immigration will continue. I agree with Marlena about that. Uh, the ebbs and flows, the ebb and flow of immigration. I think right now, what, in the last 20 years, I believe um, that w we've had the highest number of immigrants coming to the United States, uh, 24 million or something like that, the last mm -hmm. few years, 20 years or so. So, you know, barring the massive number of deportations, <laughs> you know, um, another, another yeah, topic for another time. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yes. Um, but, um, 
but yeah, but I, I definitely think there will always be a place for ethnic media and community media. And I think what will happen is that there will definitely be an evolution. Maybe the, maybe the, the subject matter, maybe the access will change. Mm -hmm. Maybe in New York the access will change mm -hmm. because of the, the, the sheer number of immigrants. I mean, the, 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 the tomb now is one in three. Yeah. You know, it's right. like everybody, uh, you know, uh, there are probably, what, ten of us in the room now? So each one of us, you know, there's yeah. three of at least three of us are from are immigrants ourselves or from an mm -hmm. arrogant par parentage, you know? Mm -hmm. So I definitely think there'll be room for that. And I think that the papers, the stage, TV stations, the websites will all evolve mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the new immigrants that mm -hmm. come and also to maybe try to reach out to I folks already here, too. And I give you an example. El Diario has, you know, change over the years. It's 100 and what? It's going to be 101, 101 years old. Yeah. It was started, it's, it's a fusion of two papers. Mm -hmm. One was started by a, Spani a Spaniard, the other one was a Dominican. And that's what's called Diario La Prensa. There's right, two right, papers right. back in those days. The, the majority of, you know, of the Spanish-speaking population was from Sp Spain, which you can count Span <laughs> Spaniards in New York City now. Right. So, and along the way, then it became like a Puerto Rican paper because the right. majority became Puerto Ricans or well, Cuban at some point after Spani mm -hmm. Spaniards and the Cubans and the Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. And now it's turning to be Mexicans mm -hmm. because it's the fastest growing, you know, among Latinos. And you're starting to see Mexican papers published in New York City now. Uh, because it's no longer, you know, yes, El Diario is a daily and we have to cover everybody, but you still need that certain publication that right. caters 100% to that one community because, again, you have different needs and El Diario cannot cover everything. Yeah. So let's do uh, something for ethnic, uh, ethnic understanding. What is the word you say instead of cheers when you toast somebody? In <laughs> Polish, it's Nazdrowia, which I think means to your health. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. in well, Creole. In, I guess in, in Creole, we can we, we, we keep it French, so it's like we could say salut, you know. Yeah. You copy on us because yeah, <laughs> so yes. Spanish is salut. This is almost the same. With the D, <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever it is, let's let's do that. All right, now. we'll All do right. this, right? <laughs> Nazdrowia. Salut. salut. <laughs>